scriptures for this morning are up on the screen. I invite you to turn to those. But first, uh, or while you're turning to those, or if you've got your electronic devices, you can turn to them really quick. Um, what I'd like for you to do this morning, can you help me praise the Lord this morning? Come on. Can you just praise the Lord? I, I want you to turn to someone this morning and, and, and tell them this morning, first of all, tell them you're special. Uh, now, don't just mean it that, you know, you're special, you're touched in the head and you're special. Tell them this morning you're special. And I'm glad that you're worshiping with me this morning. I'm glad you're here this morning. Can you tell them? If you feel comfortable doing so, give them a hug. Now, now, if you're here in the room, we're practicing social distancing, so maybe that's not what you want to do. But you can give them an air hug. Okay? Tell them you love them. Now, the question is, are you happy this morning? Now put your hands together and go absolutely crazy for the Lord this morning. Bless the Lord this morning. Praise His name. I'm so excited and blessed to be here this morning. And I'm going to do my best to not take off this early in the message this morning like I did last week. I, I tell you, I wore myself out last week before I even got started. But I am blessed to be here this morning. Are you blessed today? I mean, are, are you really blessed today? I, I, I thank the Lord for each of you. And I'm blessed. Uh, I, I'm blessed for each of you. And I'm blessed by each of you that you're a part of my life and a part of this ministry, and a part of this church, a part of this city, a part of this state, a part of our country, and a part of this world. And the reason is, is that we have an opportunity to impact this generation in a powerful way. And, the, and, and to impact this generation is a powerful thing to do especially with all that is going on in our world today. Impacting this generation is, is, is a powerful thing to do. And what a responsibility we have. It is also a costly thing. It's not easy to be anointed. It costs you something. You may pay in private for years for one anointed testimony that you testify in public. And people don't know how much it costs you to be who you are in the kingdom of God. And that's why you ought to resist any intimidation about honoring leadership. Because we're living in a day today where people get a little queasy if you say too much about anybody. As if Jesus is insecure. I don't know how you feel about it, but when I give somebody a gift, the more they like the gift the more I'm blessed by them liking the gift. And when God gives you a gift like He has, because He has gifted every one of you, you ought to just celebrate Him. You ought to, you ought to thank God. You ought to just dance all over your living room. And those of you that are in this room, you ought to dance all over this room because you have good leadership. No new car, no new house, just dance because you have good leadership. And I want you to know something this morning, those of you that are watching. Your leadership is here this morning. 
And they are here this morning because they're planning out and working out what it's, what it's going to be like to get back here to worship safely. And we ought to be dancing because we have good leadership. They're meeting extra to figure out what is needed for ministry to move forward, for us to move forward into the kingdom of God. We ought to be dancing because we have good leadership. Just thank God because we have good leadership in our congregation. I, I want you to do something. And those of you that are here, we practice something here. We do get online and we do comment on Facebook here. So you have permission to get on Facebook. We don't normally do that in worship service, but you have permission to get on Facebook and put a comment. But I want you to put a comment on, on this worship service thanking God for leadership, the leadership of this congregation. You see, I've learned something about going through really tough times. And we've gone through some really tough times lately. And what I've learned, it's, it's really not what you say, it's just being there. Just showing up for the fight. Like when someone passes away. When someone passes away, I just go and be there. Uh, some of you may not know this, some of you may not believe this, because I talk a lot, but when I go and just be there, I try not to say anything, unless the Lord leads. But I just try to be there. You know why? Because if you're really anointed, your presence charges the atmosphere. David said in Psalm 1611, You make the path of life known to me. Complete joy is in your presence, God's presence. Pleasures are by your side forever. I have learned to appreciate good people. Good people are hard to find. But I want all the good people who've ever had to contend with bad people to clap for the good people that are in their lives. Oh, I don't hear much clapping going on. because So you must not have bad people that you have to contend with. Because I, I knew, those of you that clapped, I knew you would understand. And I'm grateful to the Lord for His goodness. I'm grateful to the Lord for good people. And several from the leadership team are sitting here this morning. And I'm thankful to the Lord for all of you watching this morning. Because y'all are good people. You've supported this ministry through this crisis. You continue to pray for me. And you continue to pray for leadership. And you continue to support financially. And you continue to bring things in to help us prepare for reopening. You're patient with us as we plan and work out details. Good people. I, 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 I love you. And am grateful to the Lord for you this morning. Hopefully... Hopefully, you have received the reopening statement. It was sent out by email. The video has been posted here on Facebook. It, it, it's also been mailed out through the U.S. Postal Service. And if you've not received it yet, you will soon. If you're watching that, if you're watching, that means you have access to Facebook. And if you haven't watched the video yet to know the plan after service... Not now. After service, scroll on down and watch the video so that you have the details of the plan for reopening. And if you can't tell from the past several weeks, I just love to worship the Lord. There, there are times, there are times that I just get lost in worship. There are times when I start worshiping that I forget everything and everybody. I've made it this far because I'm a worshiper. 
I, I, I would have died if I hadn't learned how to worship. Because worship has been my nerve pill. Worship has been my sedative. Worship has been my analyst. It's been my counselor. When I couldn't fix it, I would just get alone and worship. Uh, Johnny and I were talking about, uh, talking before worship service this morning, uh, about mowing grass. And, and how much people get on my case about mowing grass. And both he and I agreed that mowing grass is our sedative. Because that's our time alone with the Lord. Now, I don't know what he does, but when I get on the tractor, I put headphones in and I listen to sermons. I listen to praise music. I know I'm weird, but I listen to sermons when I'm on the, on the tractor. And I just, I get lost. Uh, and worship the Lord. And uh, Johnny's back there saying, He talks to the Lord. And, and we just get lost in worship. And somewhere in the glory, God comes in and He steps in. And somewhere in that worship, He comes in and He heals. If you're a person who has never worshipped, you're missing something in the Lord this morning. Oh, we need to worship the Lord. I, sing, sing this with me. In my life, Lord, be glorified. Be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. Sing it again. Just sing it to Him. Just worship Him. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified, be glorified in my life, Lord, be Today in my home, Lord, be glorified, be glorified, be glorified. In my home, Lord, be glorified today. In your church, Lord, be Be glorified, be glorified in your church, Lord, be glorified today. Now just think about all the things in your life. All the trials, all the tribulations, all the things in your life. All the struggles you're going through. And just hum that chorus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
just give them to him? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Father, we come worshiping you. We thank you for good people. I thank you for the leadership of this church. I thank you for the people of this congregation. But most important today, I thank you for you. And Lord, right now, in this place, above all else, be glorified. Be lifted up. All those things that we thought about, all those trials, all those tribulations, all those things that we've been through this week, Father, we, we lift them to you. Be glorified. You have worked all things out for our good so that you can get all of the glory. Be glorified. Lord, speak to our hearts today as we study your word. Let us hear from your throne. Let your spirit have freedom. In Jesus' blessed name, amen. As you're standing, 1 Samuel chapter 18. Let's stand for the reading of the word this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1. First Samuel chapter 18, verse 1. Hopefully we'll get through this series today and next week. Uh, got a special service coming up on Father's Day. Um, and it's just going to be outstanding. You, you want to invite people to watch. Uh, we will still be online on Father's Day. Uh, actually, through the whole month of June, we're hoping to be hoping, praying, believing the Lord to be back in uh, worship with the doors open July 5th. Um, but through the rest of this month, we'll be still online. And even after July 5th, we'll be online and uh, uh, live streaming our worship services. But Father's Day... A very special service, some special things coming. I don't want to ruin the surprise, uh, but some special things coming. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Mark it off. I know it's Father's Day, and I know you do special things with your fathers, right? Right. Right. Okay? But let's do some special things with our Heavenly Father. As we honor him that day. All right, 1 Samuel 18. And it came to pass, when he has made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own. And Saul took him that day, and would not let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant. Because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. 
Now flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. If you're there, it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. Oh, we could stop and shout and go home with just that verse. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake, woo, he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. So much has been said in our generation about the promises of God. We have failed, we've, we've talked a lot about the promises, but we have failed to talk to people about the process of God. And it is essential, it is vital for our faith that you understand both the promise and the process. Because it is in the process of getting to the promise that the enemy wants to totally destroy you and cause you to be defeated and not let you be who God would have you to be, regardless of the magnitude of your faith. There are still some things that we have to go through in process to become what God would have us to be. It is expensive to be effective. It is not easy to be effective. It costs a lot to be effective. We have raised a generation of fair weather, Johnny come lately, microwave oven, instamatic Christians. That if they don't get everything they expect to get, the moment they expect to get it, they leave the church, they leave their husbands, they leave their wives, and now even children divorce their parents. People just give up. But in spite of our temper tantrums, God is not moved. There are some things that we have to go through in order to become what God wants. He, he has determined us... Uh, he has determined us to be when when you and there are some and let me try this again. I'm trying a different font and it's bigger and I don't like it. There are some things that we have to go through in order to become what God wants as and has determined us to be. When you see God displaying gifts and songs and ministries and ministers on this stage and on the stages across this nation. Don't think that they just got there, got there just because they were talented. Because there's somebody in the kitchen frying fish who's more talented than you. Oh, I didn't hear many amens in here after that one. I hate to tell you that, but there's somebody drunk under a bridge that can out-preach us, out-sing us, out-play us, and out-dramatize us. You didn't get here just because you were gifted. And God had to have your gift. But God puts a rich deposit in you through the furnace of affliction until there is a glory that transcends being gifted and crosses over the shores of giftedness on into being anointed. And the anointing becomes so rich in your life. Because it is a composite of everything that you have been through. It cannot be duplicated. It cannot be imitated. The anointing that's on you is an original anointing. I cannot be duplicated. Oh, you all should have shouted amen. I cannot be imitated. Even though some of you try. 
This anointing is an original anointing. It is fresh. It is the the unction of the Lord manifest through your life's story. And it was that unique, specific anointing that called Elisha to look at Elijah and say, I want a double portion of your anointing. And he said, if you see me when I'm taken up, one translation said, if you see what I see, if you have aligned yourself with me, if your vision has become my vision, if you walk with me through the process, if you've been with me through the Jordan, if you've been with me at Gilgal, if you've had the same experiences, then finally you will inherit the same anointing anointing from God but you cannot get the same kind of anointing until you have gone through the same kind of furnace and experiences because there are no shortcuts to it you've got to pay the full price and it costs what it costs and it doesn't go on sale do you hear what I'm saying to you this morning It's expensive to bring about a massive deliverance and it becomes effective and to become effective in the kingdom of God. And I am concerned because we are living in a generation of people where we understand the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit and the workings of the Spirit. We understand all those wonderful things like that. But we've lost the foundation. We've lost the substance. We've lost fundamentals. And we've lost the power. And we've lost the cross. And we've lost the blood. And the power of redemption. And what happened for us. And what procured us. And what bought us out of the marketplace. And you can't stand up and rebuke the devil. Until you have a bill of sin in your pocket and you know without a shadow of a doubt that you've been purchased not by your circumstances at this particular moment but by the blood of Jesus Christ which was already shed in this efficacious effective still working right now on my behalf Oh, we spend too much time learning the traditions of the church, the fundamentals of doctrine, the history of our movements, our organizations, our ecclesiastical persuasions, our protocols, our orders of worship. Too much time emphasizing our doctrine. Even those of us who say we have no doctrine, I'm sorry, we have doctrine. We make ritualism out of, out of being free. We learn everything. We know when to stand. We know when to shout. We know how to raise our hand. Not half-mast, not part-mast, but full-mast. We know when to raise our hand. We know how to fall back without hurting ourselves. But there are some things that God has done for us that we need to take another look at. All of the Bible crescendos at the cross. All of the Bible celebrates the cross. The cross epitomizes God's plan of escape for man's frustration and his predicament. It becomes a monument of God's ability to transcend every attack that the enemy throws against us. Everything that we believe, it hinges on the fact that Jesus went to the cross, died for our sin, and rose up with all power in His hand. He rose up and said, I'm not another Jesus, but I am He that was dead, and I'm alive forevermore. It took God 39 books of the Old Testament Hundreds upon thousands of shadows and types from trumpets and vows and feasts of weeks which Dawn O'Keefe loves to study and feasts of unleavened bread. Sorry, I keep throwing you under the bus, don't I? 
all the bowls and all the vials and all the trumpets and all the sheepskins and all the goatskins, all the brass, all the gold and all the silver, the very dirt on the floor, the water in the laver, the stinking stench of the burning flesh, the tabernacle, the smoke going up, the altar of incense. It took all of that. The gold laid over uh, top of the acacia wood. It took all of that for God to prophesy what he was going to do in one man. It took every Aaron, it took every Melchizedek, it took every prophet, every priest, every Samuel, every King Saul, every David, every Solomon, every Jonathan, every shadow and type in the world to make us understand the magnitude of his deliverance, of what he would do in one man's life, in the space of 33 years. It took all of the prophecies, the messianic testimonies. They called him the prophet. They called him that child, El Shaddai, Elohim, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Ditzkanu, Jehovah Rohi, Jehovah Nisi. All of the covenant names of the Old Testament are God trying to prepare our minds for the monumental deliverance that would come through a lamb. A lamb. A lamb. A, a lamb that was first seen in the book of Genesis. An animal that was covered, that covered the nakedness of Adam. Later he is identified as the spotless lamb that was killed between Cain and Abel to bring about deliverance. And then as the evolution of the lamb evolves from place to place, he is given, he, he has to give us little specifics like it will be a lot, uh, it will be without spot or blemish. It is to be a male child. Then he crescendos in Exodus by saying, the blood of the lamb is to be applied to the doorpost and the lentil. God couldn't give us the whole plan all at once. It took hundreds of years for him to give us the plan. Because the plan is so awesome. It would blow your mind. He said, not only am I going to do it through a substitute, a scapegoat, a lamb, but I'm going to take that blood of that effective, perfect, spotless, no bone broken in his body lamb to the doorpost and the lintel of the believer. Because you have to have a personal experience with the blood of the lamb. You cannot stand aloof from it. You cannot look at it. You cannot admire it and worship it. There has to be a personal encounter. You have to, you have, to have been smeared with the effective blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, are you ready for this this morning? You have to understand that He evolved. And He began to minister through the shadows and types to tell us what it, what it took for the Lamb. And finally in Isaiah, it, it, he identifies that the Lamb is not a Lamb at all, but that the Lamb is a man. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. But John points out which man it is. When he stands in the chilly Jordan with the mud between his toes and the water washing between his legs and he is baptizing out in the muddy waters of the Jordan and he looks out and not only is the lamb to be spotless, not only is it to be a male child, not only is it to be without blemish, not only is it to be killed for our sin, not only is the blood to be applied to the doorpost, not only is the man really a man, but the man is that man. Because John said the next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And from that moment on, John began to decrease so that Christ could increase. And the Lamb of God came 
to center stage. All of the Old Testament looks forward to it. The Gospels describe it. The epistles explain it. The revelation explores it. The whole book, the Bible, is about the effectiveness of the Lamb. Yes, He healed the sick. Yes, He raised the dead. Yes, He turned the water into wine. Yes, in the middle of the storm, He went for a stroll across the sea. Yes, He stopped a funeral and touched the coffin and the child woke up. Yes, He stood outside of a tomb and spoke to a dead man and called him by name until he came leaping out of his grave. Yes, He went into an upper room and shut the door on a girl whose body was dead and they were having her funeral and He disrupted the whole funeral when He walked into the room and spoke to her and said damsel arise yes he took two fish and five loaves and broke it into pieces uh, until it fed five thousand men not to mention women and children yes he spit into the eye of a blind man until the blind man opened his eyes and said I don't know anything about him all I know is I was blind but now I see Yes, he stopped by the tombs of the Gadarenes and talked to a man who could not even be chained and spoke to him and broke the demonic curse that was on his life and he spoke to the demons and he drove the demons into the pigs and the pigs into the sea because if Jesus is Lord at all, he is Lord of all. Somebody needs to shout, yes, he is Lord. And yet, and yet none of that was what he came to do. That was just what he did to occupy his time while he was here on his way to his purpose. You see, while he was here, he did all of that. That's just how he chilled. That's how he relaxed. I mean, he's so awesome. When when he got ready to go to the cross, he rebuked everybody that hindered him from going to it. They thought he was being taken. He said, I'm not being taken because no man takes my life. I lay it down. If I lay it down, I have the power to pick it back up again. He rebuked the very disciple who was trying to stop him from dying. He said, you don't know what spirit you're of. Get behind me. I've got to do this. I've got to pay full price. I've got to go through whatever I've got to go through to bring about lasting deliverance. Oh, you see, we we preach Calvary. We preach the cross from a humanistic perception. We talk about the terror of the cross, the cruelty of the cross. We talk about the devastation of the nails that were driven into the gentle skin of his hands and his feet. We talk about those nails and the horribleness of him being beaten as if that was the horror of the cross. But that is only a human perspective of horror. The horror that drove Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray that night was not the fear of nails. He didn't have to worry about the nails. He didn't didn't have to create the steel or the iron that became the nails. He could have just left that out. It was His own footprint that hollowed the mountain that became Calvary. But He could have crushed that and made it a plain, a desert, a dry place, or a wilderness. He didn't have to raise the tree that became the cross. He didn't have to create the day that would would be His crucifixion. He didn't have to let the soldier live that would have arrested Him. He could have let Him be a stillborn. All of it, you see, was God's divine purpose. God manipulating all things after the counsel of His own witness. Isn't it funny how God causes all things to work together for the good of them that love the Lord? 
how he'll be working both to do and to will according to his own good pleasure. And whether you know it or not, even right now at this moment in your life, God is orchestrating all the events and the affairs of your life that you might crescendo into your divine purpose. That's why we don't get upset with people who are upset with us. And we don't render evil with evil. And even our enemies are working together for our good. And it is good for us that we have been afflicted. For the psalmist said, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience. Experience hope and hope make it not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. That means it's all good. The bad is good. Oh, we talk about that as if it was the horror of the cross. But when Jesus goes into Gethsemane to pray, he agonizes over the eternal aspect of the cross. You see, when you start talking about Jesus, you start talking him uh, about him being some demigod. He's not a demigod. He's not a subordinate God. He's not God Jr. He's God. He's not some little God. Some little cute God. Some little shadow of a God. He's God Himself. The Bible says, Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal, equal with God. And He made Himself of no reputation. Paul said he was, he was, and without controversy, great is the mystery of the godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. And before he could finish saying that, John said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And in Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended His comprehended it not there was a man sent from God whose name was John and so on and so on until you get down to verse 14 where it says and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth The abstract was made concrete. The invisible was made visible. The unseen God manifests himself in human form. God himself. Listen, if you take a glass of of ice water and bring it to a chemist and ask him what is in the glass, he'll tell you H2O. You will say, no, it's ice water. But to the chemists, they are the same thing. They're different manifestations of the same chemical equation. One, the water is in the ice. The ice is in the water, but it is still one. You take it and put it on the stove and boil it until it becomes steam. You can see the steam going up as vapor in the air. And yet, it is still H2O. It manifests itself in a multiplicity of forms, but it is still H2O. There are some things that can be said about the steam that cannot be said about the ice. There are some things that can be said about the ice that cannot be said about the water. Regardless of the specifics of their characteristics, there are, there are, they are still one thing. Deuteronomy says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. 
unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, he is God. There is none else beside him. He manifests himself as Father in creation, Son in redemption, Holy Ghost in regeneration. Yes, they can coexist at the same time. There are some things that can be said about one that cannot be said about the other. You can identify characteristics in the Son that may not be true in the Father. There are things that happen in the Holy Ghost that you don't see in creation. And yet, He is still one God. For there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, above all, in y'all, and through you all. One, just, and, and, and before I close, are y'all still hanging in there? I just want to share one last thing. One last thought for today. One, the Father is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. Now, we've talked about these things before, right? Omnipresent. In all places at all time. The Father neither goes nor comes. And one of His names is Jehovah Shammah. Which means He's there. God is never on His way. I know we always talk about God is on His way. God is not on His way. You might be on your way. Of course, some of you might not be on your way. I know some of you. Some of you are never on your way. Some of you say you're on your way and you haven't even left the house yet. You're just starting to think about being on your way. I know how you are. You eventually get up and start getting on your way and you you start thinking about getting on your way and maybe that's being on your way when when I think about this, I think about I think that's how my grandfather thought, which drove my grandmother crazy. My grandmother hated being late. She hated being late. And yet we tore down Annabelle Street every Sunday morning heading to church. We headed toward the light, and it was only about a football field length from the house to the light. We tore down Annabelle Street doing 50 towards the light. And sure enough, we would get close to that light, and it would turn red. And we would, he would, my grandfather would slam on the brakes... And she grabbed the dashboard, and I'd be sitting in the back seat just holding my breath, seat belted in. Well, when we were in eighth grade, we didn't have to wear seat belts, but I put on a seat belt when my grandfather was driving. I was seat belted in. My grandmother grabbed that dashboard, and she go, Ralph! And he kept looking straight ahead with a stern look on his face. And he'd look to the left. And he'd make that right hand turn and we were off to the races. And we were on our way. But I want to tell you something. We'd make it to that church on time and grab the bulletin and we'd walk into worship service right before the right before the opening welcome. We were on our way. But God is not on his way. Wherever you're trying to go, God is already there. And I thank the Lord this morning and for those Sunday mornings that He is with you while you're on your way, while you're on the trip. In fact, in the Old Testament, when they called Him Jehovah Shammah, it meant the Lord is present, not on His way, 
not fixing to get there, not at the bus stop trying to catch a cab. The Lord is Shama. You don't have to wait on Him. He's already there. The truth of the matter is, most of the time, He's there waiting on us. He's waiting on us to believe Him, waiting on us to trust Him. And don't act like you're waiting on God to show up, like God just missed the bus and He'll get there sometime and you got there ahead of Him because the devil is a liar. God has been with you all the time. And I I may shock somebody this morning, but I want you to know this morning the Lord was with you even before you got saved. He was with you when you were still drunk Danny, full of Jack, full of drugs, full of whatever, all of that other crazy stuff you were stuffing in your body, driving down the interstate in the middle of the road, can't even figure out how fast you're going, smelling like everything you put in your body. It was God that didn't let the car kill you. It was God that didn't let the man shoot you in the head it was God that brought you to the church it was God preserving you so that he could save you so that he could justify you so that he could glorify you and suddenly you woke up and realized that he was there all the time Jehovah Shammah he's there he's there in the hospital he's there in the crisis he's there in the pandemic he's there in the riot. He's there in the protest. He's there in the courtroom. He's there in the storm. He's there in the problem. He's there in the situation. He's there in divorce court. He's there in the custody custody battle. He is omnipresent. He's there. He's there. He's right there in your living room. He's right there in your kitchen. He's right there in your bedroom. He's right there in your house. He's right there in your porch. He's right there in your den. He's right there on your job. He's right there in your church. He's there. I'm telling you this morning, God is there. He's there ready to accept you this morning. He's there ready to love you this morning. He's there ready to meet your need this morning. He's there ready to touch you this morning. He's there ready to heal you this morning. He's there ready to encourage you this morning. He's there ready to ignore the social distancing that the CDC has put down on human beings. But God is there there ready to shama this morning but will you allow him to shama with you will you allow him to come to you this morning will you allow him to touch you this morning will you allow him to move in your life this morning Oh, He's there. He's not just here. You don't have to be here to know Him. He's there. Jehovah Shammah. He's there. Let's pray. (coughs) Father, Thank you that you're there. Thank you. You're not on your way. You're there. Thank you that you're ready to touch, to heal, to move, to bless, to anoint, to set us free today. God, help us. Help us. Help us. 
Lord, if there's one in the sound of my voice this morning that doesn't know you as Savior, right now in the name of Jesus, bind every devil that would keep them from opening the door of their heart and accepting you as Savior. Lord, if there's one in the sound of my voice this morning that needs your touch, let them know that you're there, ready to touch them if they just open up. Move in a mighty way. And we give you all praise and glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. God's speaking to your heart. Don't wait. Don't wait. Let him work in your life this morning.